how, how I mean, what what do you think that drives this? I mean, obviously, I mean, the, the U.S. government is not a, a monolith per, you know, I mean, the 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 it is it's made up of individuals. There is certain like, you know, in any type of uh, policies uh, or practices that are implemented, there are different forces that sort of um, uh, drive it forward. I think, you know, one of the uh, one of the more interesting meta aspects of of Snowden coming forward is that is just how much private contractors now um, uh, drive and 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 function both to execute this policy and I would imagine also to expand it. Um, uh, just give me your sense of, of what 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 drives this? I mean, is it is it as simple as to simply say the U.S. government wants power, or what is going on in the individuals who execute these the, uh, these these policies? Well, as your question astutely suggests, it's always very difficult to answer a question about what motivates a huge, diffuse system like the United States to take action. It's like trying to figure out what motivated the attack on Iraq. It's almost impossible to answer that question because there's so many different motives that are found among so many different factions that compose the United States government and, and the forces that control it. So you can never really answer it in a clean, clear way that, that really is persuasive. I think the same is true here, though there are a couple of significant factors that ensure its continuation. One is institutional inertia, by which I mean that if you build this massive spying agency like the NSA and you impose no real limits on it, and you continuously pour huge amounts of money onto it and, and basically give them a mandate to learn more and more, there's nothing institutionally that will ever cause it to stop. The inertia of the institution will constantly say, let's wake up tomorrow and figure out new ways to collect even more. Let's figure out what we're not getting and find out how we can get it. It's not necessarily even a philosophical or ideological or political thought process. The dynamic is really just it's the institutional mandate to collect as much as you can. And once you have that as your mission, you don't see yourself as nefarious. You don't see any reason to stop. So you don't stop. You just keep expanding it until somebody stops it for you. And I think that's a big part of what has been happening. The other part is, is what you also suggested in your question, which is it is a huge money-making endeavor, the surveillance state. In the wake of 9-11, massive tidal waves of money just poured forth um, onto the national security state and the surveillance apparatus, which it controls. And most of this is privatized. So most of the functions of the surveillance state um, are privatized or outsourced to to private corporations. I think it's something like 25,000 people work directly for the NSA, but 60,000 people are like Snowden. They work at the NSA effectively, but are technically employed by private corporations who have contracts with the NSA. So you have this huge faction inside Washington, which is the private surveillance industry, and the private national security industry, that has a major incentive to make sure that these policies continue without limits. They have lots of power in Washington, and there's very little countervailing force that wants to and is able to ever put a stop to it because there's just not enough of an organized lobby advocating for privacy or, or against surveillance limits. And that was one of the balances that's imbalances that Snowden perceived, which is that he could go to members of the Senate or Congress, but they're so constrained with what they could do that, that, that the money behind and the power behind the surveillance state is such that it's completely uneven playing field. And the only way to try and begin to equalize that playing field is to inform his fellow citizens exactly what is going on in this world. And, and in some respects, I mean, that, 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 equalizing the playing field or to the extent that one can actually do that in this context I um, mean it is it has happened in so far as y it seems that you know and, and we are uh, doing this interview on on Tuesday on a day where um, you have uh, Republican Justin Amish and uh, John Conyers um, uh, proposing a bill which would um, end the authority under the Patriot Act, Section 215 of the mass surveillance uh, and tying this to the Pentagon budget, uh, one which I guess has, uh, uh, has, has caused uh, General Alexander to, to request a private meeting with, um, with uh, some of the Senate and House leadership. You also have Ron Wyden at the Center for American Progress going on and uh, suggesting that we need to repeal these things, talking about this regime of secret law. Uh, the, just the ability of 
codifying which we, or I should say, making public that which we have heard whispers about or people or seen people talk around now has at least um, created almost like, has almost entered this into a more democratic uh, uh, process in, in that, you know, now people have standing in court, theoretically, to take this on. This seems to me to be a, an incredibly important aspect of this. Uh, the 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 beneficial aspects of these disclosures exceed what I thought was possible in my wildest dreams when I began to work on this. And people often ask me, "How you know? Are you in regular contact with Snowden? How is he doing?" And what I always say, which is completely true, is that he couldn't be happier or more content with the choice that he made. I remember when the first time that I ever spoke with him, he told me that he wanted to out himself as the source, that he knew that he was risking very likely that he would go to prison for the rest of his life. He said he doesn't fear that at all. He he believes in the rightness of what he was doing. The only fear that he had was that he would essentially throw his entire life away to make these disclosures and that the public would just sort of look at everything and, and kind of shrug their shoulders and, and react with indifference and apathy and say, we figured most of this is already going on and, and besides, we don't really much care and that nothing would really change. And so for him to watch not only this real serious movement or for reforming the NSA that is more bipartisan in nature than anything I've ever seen in the time I've been writing about politics, and then to see this debate replicated globally in, in countless countries around the world is incredibly gratifying to him because that's what he wanted to achieve. And it's incredibly gratifying to me because when you go and, and sort of take the risks and, and do the amount of work that was necessary to, to do the reporting on the story, that's what you hope to achieve. And, and yet, yeah, I think, you know, nobody was so optimistic that, that we thought within six weeks there would be major bills with lots of bipartisan support in Congress and in the Senate and real controversy over the lies the Obama, that Obama officials told to the Congress. There'd be serious shifts in public opinion about the balance between privacy and civil liberties and security all within six weeks. It's really been extraordinary. And I think what it shows is that the reason people haven't cared about these issues before isn't because they don't care about them. It's because they simply didn't know that all of this was happening. And being able to show them in the form not of warnings or text articles, but to show them the actual documents that they can see and read for themselves, and then the process has been incredibly powerful. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating because it almost feels like there was a sort of pent-up demand within the... Um, within the House and the Senate to do something about this. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, frankly, from my perspective, uh, you know, we see all the time, you know, 85 uh, percent support of Social Security, yet uh, even the president is proposing cutting Social Security. Uh, it, it, for the most part, it doesn't feel like uh, public opinion compels our lawmakers to do much of anything. Uh, yet in this instance where, you know, I, I, I know that the, the polls have showed a, a, a change in perspective by the general population, but it doesn't seem like there's we're not seeing massive protests on the streets. We're not seeing yet. We're seeing an activity in uh, in Congress, uh, like you say, on both sides of the aisle that is unprecedented, in, at least in these uh, in this day and age. I don't know of anything else that is has garnered that maybe, you know, maybe back in the height of the the financial crisis, you know, some notion of, of, of auditing the Fed. But this seems to be broader uh, than that. And um, what I mean, I, I mean, do you think there is something in particular that is particularly offensive to lawmakers in this in that they they were left in the dark about this authority? I mean, because for me, one of the most important revelations is this notion that the FISA court has the ability to create law uh, by adjudicating on it, but but does there's no recourse for that law to be challenged, and it's not an adversarial situation. I mean, this is basically like a you know a court that issues bench warrants, you know, functioning as the Supreme Court. You know, it's a hard question to answer because you know, to be completely honest, it actually took me a little bit by surprise. I mean, I knew that these stories are going to be big stories journalistically. Like I knew they, you know, if you get 10,000 top secret documents from the most secretive agency in the U.S. government that has never leaked even a, a, like a, a snippet of a memo before, 
and you suddenly have in your possession thousands of those documents and you're about to start publishing them to the world, of course they're going to be significant. I knew they were going to you know, attract attention, but I never, I didn't think that it was going to generate the kind of sustained outrage in the elite opinion-making class and such shifts in perception on many different levels as it has. And I've tried thinking about the reasons why, and I don't really have definitive answers because one of the things that you said, which I think is true, is that a lot of lawmakers find this offensive because it somehow tramples on their institutional authority. They were lied to. These things were concealed from them. Even the authors of the Patriot Act feel like they were betrayed because now the NSA went way beyond what they all thought they were authorizing. I also think that it's just offensive on an intuitive level, like the idea that the U.S. government is collecting everybody's local and international phone records and keeping them and analyzing them and doing the same to their emails and doing all these shady, unclear agreements with Silicon Valley. I think it just feels like the kind of thing that's not supposed to be happening in, in the United States. And if you're a somebody on the left who believes in individual civil liberties or somebody on the right who believes in the right of the individual to be left alone by a limited federal government, I think it's defensive. But I don't think that gets really as far as we might want it to go in terms of explanation, because I remember in 2005, when the New York Times revealed that the Bush administration was spying on American citizens without the warrants required by law, that had all the same aspects to it. I mean, there, not only did Congress not know about it, although a few members did, like Nancy Pelosi and Jay Rockefeller and a couple other ones, but, but in general, the vast majority of members of Congress didn't know that was a case where the Bush administration was actually breaking the law that Congress had passed. It was Congress's law in 1978 that said that you can't spy on Americans without first getting warrants, and that was the law the Bush administration secretly violated. Um, and that, too, was ma you know massive d d spying in the dark, and yet there was very little of this kind of scandal. And maybe it was because we were still too close to 9-11. Mm. Um, the climate of the country was still very subservient to what the Bush administration wanted to do. Maybe it's because there weren't documents disclosed as part of that. It was just a one-time story. Um, but I, I think there's something in the ethos here that, to be honest, I just haven't quite put my finger on about why this has resonated in such a profound and, and clearly enduring way. Um, and I guess that's something we're thinking about more. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating because I, I would say those revelations about um, there was more, the, the there, there seemed to be more talk about it outside of the sort of elite class than in. And on some level, the reaction here has been that there's even, there's more response where the lawmakers are sort of almost in some respects getting out ahead of of uh, of uh, at least some of the popular movements and i and i suspect uh, the distance from from 911 and its 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 power as a political tool i mean electoral tool it has been diminished by time <laughs>